the director that we got for you uh, today is someone of extraordinary capability. His films have been recognized by Academy Awards and BAFTAs, um, and the work that he's done so far makes him one of the most important directors working in the UK and indeed internationally today. And that is Kevin MacDonald, and we're delighted to have him interviewed by the BBC presenter, Janice Forsyth. Please welcome them both. So, welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much. I was wondering, with the GFT, I, ha I feel a lovely, warm feeling when I come to the GFT because it was so much a part of growing up. I grew up um, near Bala at my local home, and, and from the age of about 12 or 13, when I could take the train in on my own, I would come into Glasgow and watch films and here, and you know, I remember seeing a Tarkovsky film here. It was my first exposure to art film. <laughs> and, and uh, I saw Hoop Dreams, which is the brilliant American documentary which followed two kids who want to be professional basketball players. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to make a, I want to make a documentary to see in the cinema. And that seemed like a really novel idea at the time. And uh, so I, I set about doing a lot of research into that. Got together with uh, an Irish Scotsman, Mark Cousins, who many of you might remember, might know. And uh, we, we edited a book about documentaries, which was really just an excuse to learn about what people had done in documentaries around the world. And then I made a film called One Day in September, um, which was a feature documentary kind of, and, the, the, and the, the, the idea of it was an investigation into what happened at the Munich Olympic Games in 1972. Um, there were various mysteries still, you know, most of you probably know there was a, was a, there was a terrorist attack, pa pa Palestinian terrorists uh, um, held hostage about a dozen uh, Israeli athletes and coaches and trainers. And there were all sorts of, when you looked into this event, there were all sorts of strange mysteries still surrounding it. And I thought we could do an investigation in that, into that. And the sort of novel approach would be we would cut it as though it was a thriller. Cut the whole film like a thriller. The real life narrative was very much that of a thriller, anyway, Absolutely. wasn't it? Absolutely. It took place over a limit, you know, it's 24 hours pretty much from start to finish. Um, there's, there's a negotiation, there's a, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a chance that it looks like it's all going to be resolved peacefully and then something goes wrong, there's cops try and come in and, and raid the apartment and then you've a You've got your ticking clock. Absolutely, yeah. you've totally got your ticking clock. And um, you've got this bigger political significance, of course, behind the whole, behind the whole event. Of course, based on the, the book by Joe Simpson, um, uh, his account of his climb in the Peruvian Andes with his friend Simon Yates, um, this, they did this in 1995, attempting to scale the unclimbed west face of the Sula Grande mountain. I mean, I think the clue is in the word unclimbed. Why do you like this? Somebody sent me this, this, uh, this book. The producer sent me a book, Touching the Void. I hadn't read it. I remember I was on a trip going somewhere and I started on the plane thinking, climbing, I'm not sure. And uh, you know, there I was then sort of, you know, desperately trying to finish it during the plane journey and completely, completely gripped by it. And, was desperate to do it and had to figure out, you know, how do you turn this book into a documentary? Mm -hmm. We had a group of climbers who came with us, there were half a dozen of them who worked on with film crews, and they were absolutely fantastic. There was sort of like six of them, and there was a crew of six, and that was it. When we went to the, when we went to the um, um, back to Peru to to see the Grande, and then the rest of them we we shot in the Alps, all the sort of close up stuff of the actors we shot. I presume that's the trickiest thing you've ever been involved in, oh, physically. Yeah. Oh, physically, absolutely, yeah, e extraordinarily difficult because you know you get a camera into position and you decide, oh, I want to actually get in the wrong place, I want to move it, and it would take three hours to move it from there to there, and uh, you know you'd get you'd have to half climb, half be pulled up into a position. Interesting, actually, just thinking about the films and, and you know, Last King of Scotland, the transition into into fiction. Uh, this came out in 2006 and adapted from Charles Foden's novel and adapted by Peter Morgan, mm -hmm. ubiquitous mm. of the deal, the Queen, Frost Nixon fame, and a script primarily uh, about the relationship between two people, Ugandan dictator, President Idi Amin, and this fictional doctor, I think it's made up a composite of these, yeah. Doctors uh, Nicholas Garrigan. I, I spoke to James McAvoy about the film and about his the character of Nicholas Garrigan just shortly after the film um, came out, and he was saying, you can tell us whether this is true or not, yeah. but that he had pushed for the character to be slightly less simpatico, mm. um, to reveal that he was actually enjoying being mm. the favoured one in the court mm. of, of President Idi uh, Amin, and actually was kind of using using him, using other people around him. 
Um, so there was more of that, that sort of conflict coming through. Two not very nice people, one absolutely. No, I mean, I think that's true. I think, I think James and I, I met James very early on in casting that film about a year before, maybe not a year or so, but some months anyway before we made it and before it was greenlit. And I met him and I thought, he, you're perfect. You're the guy. I, I, you know, I'd seen him on TV, I'd probably seen him on State of Play, the original TV series. What was it like dealing with, you talked about the James McAvoy, but yeah. was clearly a, a fantastic role, but I mm. believe he was totally method in his approach. Yeah, no, he was, he was, he was very method. I mean, Forrest had never been to, well, first of all, he's famous for being the gentlest and sweetest and least violent person you'll ever meet in your life. So to, to sort of see him playing this character, who this is quite comic in this scene, but <coughs> becomes progressively darker and more psychotic throughout the film. Um, he, uh, you know, that was a bit, bit of a leap, but again, when I met him, and he'd come in and read a, few, read a few lines of the script for me, you could just see there was something very dark in him. Too. You weren't something. convinced early on, were you? Well, so, by the idea of Forrest well, I wasn't. Of I wasn't convinced by the idea because one of the, the one of the producers, Andrea Calderwood, who used to be at BBC Scotland, she had always been telling me, oh, Forrest Whitaker, he's like Forrest Whitaker. And I said, no way, he's so nice, no way, but not Forrest Whitaker. And I started looking at African actors and I met some South Africans and Nigerians, and really cut cut the mustard. And then um, I went and met some Hollywood actors and I met Forrest. And um, when I met him, I thought, actually, you know, there is something in you. There's something, there's something that can do this part. There's something frightening in you. Um, and he said to me, I have, I've got a lot of anger in me, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> the Eagle of the Ninth, which is the film that you, you're still working on at the moment, I think you've finished shooting it, though, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, just, no, just, just editing at the moment. Now, that strikes me that is a complete departure for you, because that's yeah. about the Romans in Scotland. It's based on this 1950s novel, which I think you loved when you were a little boy. Yeah, yeah. Rosemary Sutton. Yeah. Uh, and about what happened to the, this lost legion who marched into Scotland uh, and vanished. But that's something that you presumably you can't. I'm wondering if you can bring any of your kind of methodology or those sort of. I think so because I think nobody's ever, so I think tried to do a kind of ancient world swords and sandly kind of film, but do it in a documentary way, <coughs> and to try and really make it feel. You know, we filmed it in Scotland out in the wet in November and. Um, one of our extras is here who ran around. He's uh, he Boy, was, did he you was, think? Yeah, <laughs> didn't you? Well, he wasn't a Roman, he was a, he was a Celt. Um, but uh, uh, he'll testify to the fact that it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, it was an attempt to be quite anthropological about well, what it must have been like on the edge of empire and mm -hmm. uh, um, come into contact with these, these tribes who had such a different social system, such a different culture to the Roman culture. Well, thank you so much. For joining us today. It's been a delight. It's been great just hearing you open up about the clips. Um, totally wonderful to see you and thank you all very much for your questions and for your attention. Please join me in thanking Kevin. I think it's great to see a local a local guy that's, that's gone so far. Really interesting and really charming and I think uh, he's one of the best filmmakers working in the UK. I mean I've um, really enjoyed his work from, from the beginning and amazing range of stuff he's done. Yeah. And uh, they've all been so different but you know all of them fantastic.